introduce our wonderful speaker today. We have Dr. Marjean Taylor Culp is a distinguished professor at the Ohio State University College of Optometry. She completed her Doctor of Optometry postdoctoral fellowship in pediatrics and binocular vision and a postdoctoral master's degree in vision science at the Ohio State University College of Optometry. She has served as site principal investigator at the Ohio State College of Optometry Clinical Center for over numerous multi-center clinical vision research studies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Culp. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for an overview of the ABCs of children's vision and vision screenings and exams. Vision screenings and exams are important because children don't know how they should be seeing and they're often unable to tell us how they are seeing. And vision problems often don't hurt and often vision problems are not obvious. So it's often difficult for a parent to know whether or not a vision problem is present. Also vision problems are very common. So about one in five children have a vision problem and early detection and treatment can often prevent vision loss or decrease the impact of the vision problem. And vision can be important to learning. So one study showed that about 70% of the school day involved visually based tasks. And there's also been studies that have shown the impact of treating vision problems. So for example, one study showed that if they provided screening or when they provided screening and glasses for patients, it increased their likelihood of passing an achievement test. And another study showed that children with vision disorders were more likely to, perform, to report low performance in school. So having good vision can be important to, uh, to the learning process. But it's, it's found uh, surprisingly that many children have not received any vision, any vision testing. So you can see here, this is a report of the percentage of children who, uh, or whose parents report that they received vision testing, and this is any vision testing. Uh, but you can see that um, it's uncommon for young children to report any, any testing. So whether that's vision screening or a vision exam. And it's even less common for young children to have an eye exam. So you can see here um, in children who are zero to five, uh, less than a third of patients' parents reported that they had had an eye exam and only about a half of children who are six to 11. So most who had had any vision testing, it was uh, screening only and very few had any eye exam. And even uh, any testing, uh, there was still a significant percentage of children who hadn't received any vision testing at all. So it's important to think uh, about the difference between screenings and exam and, and exams and why screenings and exams are each important. So screenings can be helpful to identify vision problems and to identify children who are at risk for vision problems. Um, and as I mentioned, it's really important to identify vision problems early because early detection and treatment of vision problems can prevent serious vision loss and or decrease the impact of the vision problem. Uh, but screenings are not a replacement for eye exams. But screening tests are designed, here's just a couple examples of screening tests and screening tests are designed to have very high testability. So in one study, we found that less than 2% of preschool children were unable to do each test. So you can see, here's a couple examples um, where the child just needs to look at a picture in a device, for example, or just has to match some, sh some shapes in order to sell, tell whether or not they're able to see clearly. And uh, it was also shown that not only were most children able to complete the test, but uh, if a child was not able to complete these tests, they were more than two times more likely to have a vision disorder than those who passed the tests. 
With vision screenings, it's also important to think about what the sensitivity of the test is and what the specificity of the test is. So with sensitivity, that's the percentage who have the vision disorder who are correctly identified or referred from the screening test. And you can see here that, uh, that some of the best vision tests are sensitive to identifying children who have the most severe vision conditions, but you can see that it varies uh, depending on the screening test that's used, uh, what the sensitivity is. But you can see that even with these sensitive vision tests, that there's still uh, one or two out of 10 children who have a severe vision problem who are being missed by screening tests. And screening tests are are really focused at identifying children who have reduced vision. Um, and there's other vision problems that are not uh, the focus of screenings. So that's important to keep in mind as well. And typically screenings <clears throat> uh, have a small percentage of children who are, um, who are over-referred or children who are um, normal, who have normal vision, but are uh, referred by the, by the screening. So typically um, in a lot of cases, about one out of 10 um, are over-referrals, but that's a very small percentage. So typically uh, the majority of children who are, who have normal vision are passed by the screening. However, even though uh, there is generally uh, good sensitivity and good specificity, so generally most of the referrals are true referrals, um, unfortunately, it's been shown that uh, there's often not follow-up after the school vision screening failure. So it's been shown that uh, in, in other studies and also here in Ohio, that uh, many who fail a vision screening don't receive that follow-up eye exam. And it was estimated in Ohio that there were 35,000 children who needed glasses who didn't receive them. And here, these are some possible barriers that have been suggested um, as to why that follow-up care didn't occur. And there's actually been a children's vision strike force that's been created here in Ohio to try to address that issue. Uh, but it's been shown, as I mentioned, that, um, that a lot of times there isn't that follow-up that occurs. And a, a recent study showed that the uh, percentage of children who had had a comprehensive eye exam was uncommon, even among those who had a serious treatable vision disorder. So one example of a serious vision dis disorder that we'll talk about is amblyopia or lazy eye. And even in children where it was associated with an eye turn, um, only about 40% of those children had had a prior eye exam. And among children who had um, lazy eye or amblyopia, um, that's um, a less obvious type, only 14 to 18% of those children had had an eye exam. So uh, it's this goes to the point that that these vision problems are really not obvious. Um, so it's important to have an eye exam to identify these problems. One common myth that uh, is, you sometimes hear is that young children aren't able to have an eye exam, but really children can have an eye exam at any age. So there's objective tests that are available to be able to assess children's vision, uh, even in infancy. And there is an infant C program that's available to provide a one-time no-cost eye and vision assessment for infants that are six to 12 months of age. And you can find uh, a participating eye doctor by going to infantc.org. And the uh, pediatric eye service at the College of Optometry does participate uh, in that program as well. And there is a QR code uh, that you can scan if that's of interest. And similarly, in young children, uh, vision testing there is developed to be able to assess children at any age. So there's objective tests that are available to assess children's uh, need for glasses and their eye health. And there's tests that are developed or that have been developed and that are available 
to allow them to respond in a child-friendly way. So children can uh, tell us how clearly they can see by matching shapes, for example, um, or by uh, tell us their depth perception by pointing to the smiley face, for example, or being able to find uh, um, identify pictures of animals that are um, that are only seen in 3D, for example, or point to shapes to tell us uh, how good their color vision is, for example. So there's uh, there's lots of tests that are available that allow us to assess the, the vision of children at any age um, and be able to tell how well they can see. So now let's talk about some common vision problems and it's helpful first to take a step back and think about what we want out of our vision. So it's important for our vision to be clear and also we want our vision to be single. We want to see uh, things single and we also want to have comfortable vision. So those are some things to think about as we talk about different common vision problems. And as I mentioned, often vision problems are not obvious, but there are some common signs of vision problems or there are some signs of vision problems that can occur. So these are some things to think about in order to um, make sure that you follow up with an eye exam if you do see any of these vision problems. One of the most common vision disorders that are, are observed in children is significant refractive error. And we'll talk about some specific types of significant refractive error, uh, but this is uh, the most frequently occurring disorder and it's also the most correctable. So this is easily correctable with glasses or contacts, but if uncorrected in some cases, it can lead to amblyopia or eye turns and it can interfere with uh, performance with learning as well, as we'll talk about. So one common vision problem is nearsightedness or myopia. And in this case, the light is focused in front of the retina. Um, and with lenses, with glasses or contacts, then that will allow the light to be focused on the retina for clear vision. But with uncorrected nearsightedness, distance objects are going to look look blurred for these patients. And it's been estimated that currently about 40% of Americans are nearsighted. And you can see here that it's not very common in the youngest of children. So from ages zero to four, um, it's not very common, but you can see that the prevalence increases in school age and school age children and older children and young adults. And you can see that the prevalence of nearsightedness is really increasing. So this shows the prevalence of nearsightedness in 2000 and then also the expected prevalence in 2050. So it's been estimated that um, or predicted that half of the world's population will be myopic or nearsighted by 2050. So this is really a problem of increasing prevalence. It's been shown that uh, it's predictive of nearsightedness uh, based on the number of myopic parents that a child has, and also the number of sports and outdoor activity hours per week that a child does. So those things have really been shown to be predictive of whether or not uh, myopia develops or nearsightedness develops. And so it's been recommended that children should have one or more hours a day at least of outdoor daily time. And it's also been shown that high nearsightedness or high myopia is associated with a higher risk of developing serious sight-threatening eye disease. And about half of children who develop nearsightedness by age seven or eight do develop high myopia. So um, it's also important to try to slow the progression of nearsightedness in children. So it's important to identify ch children who have nearsightedness early and also try to slow the progression of nearsightedness. 
So there's been a lot of research recently about the best ways or the most effective ways to slow the progression of nearsightedness. And uh, these treatments are becoming more and more common. Um, and it's important to try to slow the progression of nearsightedness um, in children when it develops. And some ways that it can be slowed are with contact lenses. There are special contact lenses that can be used to slow the progression of nearsightedness. Um, there's also drops that can be used to slow the progression of nearsightedness um, and spectacle lenses that are um, being developed to slow the progression of nearsightedness as well. Another common vision problem in children is farsightedness and or hyperopia. In children who are farsighted, um, the light focuses uh, behind the retina, as you can see illustrated here. And again, lenses, glasses, or contacts can be used to focus the light onto the retina. But for children who, um, who have, uh, and it's common for, um, for the youngest of children to be a little bit farsighted, but um, for children who have above age normal levels of farsightedness, for those children, they need to do extra work in order to keep the vision clear. So they need to do that extra work, even at distance, but more so, especially at near, everybody needs to do a little bit of work, needs to do some work to keep things clear up close. And so um, for patients who have uh, above age normal levels of farsightedness, it can be difficult for them to maintain clear vision uh, both at distance and particularly at near because of that moderate farsightedness. And you can see that that moderate farsightedness increases the risk for amblyopia or lazy eye um, and eye turns in children. So you can see here that children who have moderate to high hyperopia um, are at significantly greater risk for lazy eye than children who don't have hyperopia, don't have moderate uh, to high hyperopia. And, and uh, similarly, children um, with moderate to high hyperopia are at significantly greater risk for uh, eye turns as well as compared to children who do not have um, moderate to high hyperopia. And that's been shown in other studies as well that there's a significantly greater risk in these children who have uh, moderate to high hyperopia or above age normal levels of hyperopia for their age. Moderate to high farsightedness or hyperopia has also been associated with significantly lower scores in early literacy. And uh, these deficits were greatest in the area of print knowledge. Um, and also it's been associated with decreased scores in visual attention and visual motor integration and with decreased near visual function. So for example, um, children often had difficulty with seeing clearly up close or with focusing up close or with their depth perception up close as well. Astigmatism is another common vision problem that occurs in young children. And it's been shown that um, oral read reading fluency can be signif significantly reduced in children who have uncorrected astigmatism. And uh, this can be improved when the astigmatism is corrected. So with astigmatism, vision is often blurred at all distances uh, because these children have uh, different prescriptions in different meridians of the eye. So for example, um, they may have a different level of correction um, in, their, uh, in the horizontal meridian as compared to the vertical meridian of the eye um, as an example. So that can cause blurred vision at all distances as you can see um, as an example here uh, without correction. Another common vision problem that can occur is anisometropia. And in patients who, who have anisometropia, there's a difference in the refractive error between the two eyes. 
So there's a difference um, in the prescription in each eye, and this puts children at great risk for lazy eye or amblyopia. Um, if one eye is, for example, much more farsighted or has much greater astigmatism, for example, than the other eye, then often uh, the vision doesn't develop well um, in that eye because the patient tends to use the eye that has the, the um, lower amount of refractive error. Um, so um, that brings us to amblyopia or lazy eye, which is another common vision problem in children. So this occurs in about uh, one in 20 children. And in children who have amblyopia or lazy eye, they have reduced visual acuity in one or both eyes. And it's also often associated with reduced depth perception and uh, difficulty with eye movements. And in children who have lazy eye, um, even when you put the glasses correction or the spectacle correction on the children, um, it doesn't uh, immediately improve the vision. So these children, once even once you put the vision correction on, um, there's still reduced vision that's present. And this decrease in vision is not attributable to any sort of um, obvious ocular health problem. Uh, and this is a leading cause of vision loss in one eye in children and young adults. And it can lead to um, uh, occupational limitations as well um, if it's not, uh, if the vision loss remains. And patients are also um, at greater risk for blindness in the good eye if they have amblyopia. So this is a significant um, public health vision problem. It's really important to identify patients who have amblyopia or lazy eye early because treatment is most effective at younger age and treatment is often successful in improving vision significantly. Um, sometimes there is uh, residual or small levels of amblyopia that remain, but um, there are significant improvements in vision that occur with treatment. And um, as I mentioned, it's most effective at the youngest ages. So you can uh, treat children uh, at older ages who have amblyopia, but it's most effective at younger ages. So it's really important to identify and treat children at, at, as young as possible in order to have the best treatment effect. So some common treatments, um, treatment often includes glasses, so prescription for any uh, refractive error that's there, any farsightedness, for example, or any stigmatism that's present. Um, so glasses are often an important part of treatment. Um, another common treatment is patching, as you see illustrated here. Um, a, another common treatment is um, to use atropine drops, and there's also um, treatments that are uh, have recently become available um, that are binocular types of therapy um, that uh, the child is using both eyes at the same time. So with these um, patching treatment, for example, um, the good eye is covered to, um, uh, to uh, increase the use of the amblyopic eye or to force the use of the amblyopic eye. Uh, but currently there's some treatments that are being uh, used more often that involve both eyes. So the patient is using both eyes, uh, but for example, um, there's a dim different image that's seen by each eye and the image that's seen by the good eye is presented at a lower contest, contrast or it looks dimmer than the image that's seen by the amblyopic eye, for example. And the child has to use both eyes or integrate both eyes um, together in order to see the, um, either to see the movie or the show that they're watching, for example, or to play a game. Um, so there's different games that are presented, for example, through virtual reality or different movies that are presented through virtual reality devices um, that, uh, have the child using both eyes together, but still they're encouraging the use of that amblyopic eye and trying to promote the use of that amblyopic eye, but in a, um, in a binocular way. And there's also some studies um, that are uh, currently underway um, evaluating the effectiveness of these binocular therapies as well. Strabismus is another common eye problem that's seen. Um, so this has a prevalence of about three to 4%. Uh, 
And if left uncorrected, this can be a common cause of amblyopia or lazy eye as well. And uh, strabismus has, or eye turns have been associated with um, psychosocial, psychosocial issues in patients as well and decreased quality of life. Um, and again, uh, early treatment is important when strabismus is present um, and treatments for strabismus or turned eyes um, can, incur, can, uh, can include uh, proper prescriptions, uh, prism, um, where it move, where the prism moves the image in front of the eye that's turned, um, or virgins therapy or surgery are common treatments for uh, for strabismus or turned eyes in children. Um, so those are uh, some of the most common uh, vision problems that are seen in children, and those these are the types of problems that are often targeted by vision screenings, but there's other common problems that occur in children as well. Uh, so, um, so next we'll talk about some other common vision problems um, that can occur in children. Um, and these are you know, really not uh, things that are typically going to be identified by uh, vision screenings. So one thing um, that, ha that has to occur whenever we're looking at something up close is the eyes need to focus. So um, this is referred to as accommodation. So the eyes need to accommodate or focus whenever you're looking at something up close in order to see it clearly. So it's important to keep in mind that um, that, that focusing uh, does require some work. And also um, it's important when you're looking at something um, that, uh, that your eyes are really accurately aligned on what you're looking at in order to see it single. And so um, every time you look at something up close, you need, your eyes need to turn in. And every time you look at something far away, your eyes need to turn back out or diverge. And so the ocular virgin system always needs to maintain this accurate alignment as we're looking at things at different distances. So as we're looking at something uh, to read, for example, um, and then as we're looking at something far away, our, our ocular virgins always needs to uh, be changing and needs to be staying accurately aligned on what we're looking at in order to keep our single vision. And so our, our fusional virgin system um, has to always keep working, especially uh, a lot of people, um, a lot of children, their eyes might have a tendency to drift out a little bit or drift in a little bit. So for example, um, one thing that's common is uh, um, convergence insufficiency, which we'll talk a bit more about in a minute, um, but sometimes the eyes have a tendency to drift out a little bit. Um, and so then the eyes have to work harder to converge and to keep the single vision. So um, patients have to, um, so if a patient's eyes tend to drift out a little bit, for example, they have to do that extra work in order to maintain single vision. And if you're not able to do that work, then often blurry vision or double vision occurs. And double vision can be very, uh, you know, uh, very um, uncomfortable or unpleasant for patients um, if that occurs. And if a patient has to do a lot of this extra work on a continuous basis, that can result in uncomfortable vision that can result in eye strain. And it's very common to have these uh, dysfunctions of focusing or virgins. Um, so these accommodative or virgins dysfunctions are common and they're even more common after concussion. So um, about uh, one in 20 patients uh, will often have um, a accommodative or virgins dysfunction. And it's been shown to be even more common after concussion with about half or more of patients uh, reporting these disorders after concussion. So what are some common focusing problems that can occur? in children. So um, one thing that can occur is that they just may not ha have sufficient amount of accommodative ability or focusing ability. So they might have a decreased um, amount of focusing ability 
or they may have uh, a decreased flexibility of accommodation, um, or in some cases, they might have their focus sort of stick um, up close as well. Um, and therapy has been shown to be able to improve these focusing abilities in children. Another common vision problem, a common binocular vision problem in children and in adults is convergence insufficiency. And with convergence insufficiency, um, this can occur, uh, um, the most severe type can occur in about 120 patients and less severe types, um, but still that often cause symptoms can occur in about one in five children and adults. And with convergence insufficiency, the eyes have a tendency to drift out when somebody is looking at something up close. So for example, when you're reading or doing close work, um, the eyes can tend to drift out. And so the patients always have to do uh, make this extra effort to keep the eyes aligned on the near target that they're looking at. So keep aligned on what they're reading, for example or on the computer um, or on the tablet that they're looking at. Um, and if they're not able to do that, as I mentioned, they'll often see double. Um, and oftentimes that extra effort can result in common symptoms. And that can interfere, interfere with, with reading, for example. So these are some common symptoms that are often uh, reported in children um, and in young adults who have convergence insufficiency. So you can see that it's very common to report um, loss of place when reading, for example, um, losing concentration when reading, having to reread things over and over again, or feeling like they read very slowly or difficulty remembering what was read or feeling sleepy, um, or words blurring, or uh, words doubling, or things doubling when they're um, trying to read or do near work, um, or having headaches, or having the eyes feel sore or uncomfortable. So it's very common um, for patients with convergence insufficiency to report uh, these symptoms with near work, or in some cases to avoid um, near work because uh, uh, they're having symptoms or having difficulty with uh, with near work. And treatment of near of convergence insufficiency has been shown to be very successful. So there are um, eye exercises that can be done to improve the ability to converge the eyes. Um, there's been studies that have shown that in-office therapy was the most uh, effective treatment and that this was very successful in improving patients' convergence abilities. And uh, there's also other types of binocular vision disorders that can occur. So for example, um, in some cases, the eyes have a tendency to um, drift in at near um, or drift out at distance, for example, or drift in or out at both distances. Um, so other types of binocular vision disorders are also common um, and they also cause uh, similar symptoms to those um, that we just discussed um, at the distance at, at which they occur. So common treatments for these binocular vision disorders include therapy or lenses can be used to um, treat these disorders in some cases as well. Another common vision problem that uh, you might hear about is our color vision defects. Um, and these occur in about 8% of males of European descent. And in uh, um, with our color vision, there's different cones that we have in our, uh, in, our in our vision that allow us to see colors. So there's cones that are that are sensitive to short wavelengths or medium wavelengths or long wavelengths. And so um, it can uh, we can have things go wrong with that. So we can be missing one or more of the cone systems. Um, so a, not a pigment can be non-functional um, or a pigment can be abnormal. And so this shows an example of what it can look like. 
uh, to someone who has a color vision defect. So um, with normal color vision, you can see um, this is what uh, this would look like to someone who has normal color vision. Um, whereas you can see this is what it can look like to someone who has a color vision defect, either um, a problem with that um, cone that's sensitive to medium or uh, long wavelengths. So you can see that with color vision defects, um, there's color confusions that can occur in these patients. Um, so reds can be confused with browns or dark greens, and purples can be confused with navy blue or pinks with sky blue, um, and bluish greens can, occur, can appear gray, and uh, yellows can be confused with orange, and orange can be confused with bright green. Um, so it's difficult for patients with color vision deficits to um, discriminate pastels and dark colors and things that are um, small or far away. So these color confusions are common with uh, color vision deficits. So when are eye exams recommended? So the AOA recommends that um, children have an eye exam um, at birth through two years. And as I, uh, uh, so specifically um, at six to 12 months of age, um, it's recommended that children have an eye exam. And as I mentioned, um, the infant C program is available to um, have a one-time no cost eye exam for, for infants who are six to 12 months of age. And then also eye exams are recommended at least once between three to five years of age um, for children who are um, asymptomatic or at low risk. And then again, before first grade and then annually thereafter, eye exams are, are recommended. Oops, sorry. Um, it's also important to remember eye safety. So sports-related eye injuries are common, but generally they are preventable. So you can see that um, eye injuries are common in children, um, and these are often present preventable. So it's important to uh, make sure that children are wearing appropriate safety eyewear and that the safety eyewear that's worn is specific for, um, for that sport. So you want to make sure that the sports eyewear that's worn is uh, specifically for that sport. And also you wanna make sure that, um, that the safety eye equipment that's worn um, is uh, approved by an authorized certification organization such as the uh, Safety, eye, uh, safety Equipment Institute. Um, it's also important to remember that um, contact lenses require a prescription. So as we're coming up on Halloween, um, it's important to remember that all contact lenses are um, devices that require a prescription. They are not a one size fits all um, thing. So um, it's really important that uh, the contact lenses fit the patient's eye and that they are sterile and that they're providing appropriate oxygen transmission. So it's really important to make sure that, um, that you're um, only getting contact lenses through a, a prescription. And um, this is not something that should be um, purchased without a, a prescription. Um, some resources that can be helpful um, are here. So um, there's a, a great book that's available through Google Books that's available at no cost um, that uh, tells a little bit about an eye exam. Um, so there's a link here to, um, to that uh, book that's available at no cost. Um, there's also the Ohio Amblyopia Registry um, that can provide patches for children who've been diagnosed with amblyopia. Um, and there's a link to that here. And um, the, the book, The Patch, can also be helpful um, for children who have amblyopia as well. Um, Another uh, thing that's a helpful resource, not specifically related to vision, but um, Dolly Parton's Imagination Library, um, if you're not familiar with that, that provides uh, books to uh, preschool children um, at no cost um, for eligible participants. Um, so if that's of interest, that's something that uh, eligible uh, folks can sign up for, for young children. Um, and uh, there's also some books that are available, uh, some activity books 
that are available through the National Eye Institute that um, you can see there's links to these here. So there's some posters with some uh, fun information, some fun vision facts, um, and there's some activity books that uh, are helpful for learning about vision um, that are available as well. So um, these outreach materials are available through um, the National Eye Institute at no cost, and there's some links for those uh, uh, available here. Um, also, uh, Realize in Ohio provides classroom education, so um, teachers can sign up for Realize education programs. There are six standardized, interactive, age-appropriate curricula that are available, and these are available from pre-K, pre-kindergarten, pre um, to grade 12. So um, these programs cover topics like eye anatomy and eye safety and eye disorders. So these are um, really wonderful interactive programs that can be um, present, presented in schools. So um, if anybody's interested in signing up for those uh, programs, um, if any teachers are interested in those programs for their school, um, uh, those, uh, the link is available uh, to sign up for those programs here. There is a pediatric clinic here on campus that provides eye care for children of all ages, um, and that's uh, located on Neal Avenue. Um, so uh, you can see that here. And again, uh, the campus clinic provides eye care for children of all ages. And there's also uh, clinics in Pickerington and Upper Arlington that provide eye care for children who are ages six and up. Um, and the addresses for each of those uh, clinics is shown here. Um, there's also research opportunities that are available. Um, so there's also um, research opportunities for children, for example, who have uh, lazy eye or amblyopia or nearsightedness, for example, or um, uh, certain eye turns, uh, um, intermittent outward eye turns, for example. Um, so there are some research opportunities that are available. So studies, National Eye Institute funded studies, for example, that provide care. Um, and there's a link to those if you look at uh, currently recruiting studies. Um, and there's also um, research opportunities that can be um, explored on cl clinicaltrials.gov's website as well. And there's a link to that um, shown here. Um, there's also additional services available for, um, for patients of all ages at the main campus clinic um, as well. And there's uh, um, some examples of those um, services shown here. So um, advanced ocular care, contact lenses, um, low vision, um, myopia management uh, therapy. Um, and there's also an eye ga eyewear gallery that's uh, available as well. Um, on campus and also at the, um, at the other clinics that I mentioned as well. Um, and uh, um, you can make an appointment uh, by scanning this QR code or um, calling the number here. Thank you so much for your attention. Please let me know if you have any questions.